Evelyn, thank you for taking time and your busy schedule in Australia to join us for a conversation. Can you tell us a little bit about the sort of academic work you do and who you see as your audience and what you're seeking to achieve? Yeah, well, for the last um, few years, but uh, particularly intensely for the last couple of years, I've been looking at the development of what is probably best called social justice scholarship. So that, that includes all kinds of theories which stem from postmodernism, um, post-colonial theory, queer theory, intersectional feminism. And I've been looking at some problems that I see with that, with a, a sort of epi epistemology, knowledge claims which aren't supported by evidence, and ethics which aren't consistent. So my colleagues and I have, have just finished a, a sort of year and a half project of trying to get inside the system and show the problems with it. I think my audience is, is, the, gen is the average person, really at the moment because we are trying to get through to academics that there is a problem going on. We're having some difficulty with that and I don't think the average person really, they, they see some symptoms of the problem, they might call it political correctness or identity politics, but I don't think they always understand where it's coming from and how it works, so I'm, I'm trying to break all that down. Thanks, yeah I think uh, it's a good point you make, you know, we should never underestimate the intelligence and thoughtfulness of people in the community, I learnt that in a long time in public life, but they must look overhead at the moment and think, good grief, the world's going mad. Mm. We've got the lunar right up there saying we've got to go back to a golden era that probably didn't really ever exist. Mm -hmm. We've got the lunar left saying we want to take you to a future that will never be achievable, some sort of nirvana. Uh, we've got, if you like, a rise in religious extremists with people saying I can save myself by blowing others up. Uh, and then we've got an atheistic movement that's saying if we can just get rid of all religion, everything will be all right. None of those are true. The person in the street knows it. Mm -hmm. But can we begin perhaps? I'm not sure the old left versus right distinction is very useful anymore. Where would you put yourself and, and, and how do you see the issues of how we describe ourselves on the political spectrum? I, th I think we're, we're looking at two different things here because in political culture, when we're talking about ethics and how the world works, left and right doesn't work so well as a binary anymore because the, the arguments then are between the authoritarians and the anti-authoritarians and uh, the people who want freedom of speech and the people who want to censor speech and then we have um, all kinds of arguments going back and forth about identity and this and and the value of science and reason and evidence versus experiential knowledge and that so we've got this big mess in culture but I think that the left and right does um, still make sense on a political level because we have to vote for particular policies so when it comes to policies we're back to a very sort of practical thing how it affects how it affects people living their lives and while the culture certainly feeds into that we still need to be having conversations between uh, leftist ac economics and, and rightist economics and, and social policies so I consider myself a left liberal and by that I mean I am economically left I would like to tax people quite a lot and then pay for for um, good welfare services I'd want nationalized health care and this kind of strong safety net. But I am a liberal, which not all lefties are. And I know in Australia, that's often more associated with the right, but um, liberal is, is more associated with the left in the UK and the US. So I am a liberal in the sense that I, um, I, I want to see more, more freedom, more individuality, more, more focus on the equal opportunities for, for people and, and a general sort of um, fairness, that very broad label of, of liberal. Uh, that's an interesting question, the, the, the issue of uh, uh, equality. I take it that you would draw a distinction between equality of opportunity and of outcome? Yeah, we're never going to achieve um, equality of outcome, but I think we do have to be careful to make us as certain as possible that the reason there isn't an equality of outcome is, bec is not because there are disadvantages getting there. And they can come at all, all sort of different stages of life within education, um, outright discrimination, or you know, social, socialised ideas about who should be doing what. So I don't disagree with the identitarian lefties 
that disadvantages can exist. As an economic lefty, I'm, I'm generally more concerned about class disadvantages than identity disadvantages, but I accept both exist. But I think when we get to the point of, um, yeah, of outcomes, we do need to accept that people People differ generally. They're not going to make the same decisions and, and they're not going to have the same abilities. <laughs> you and your two American colleagues, James Lindsay and Peter Bogosian, were behind the grievance study scandal, which has achieved quite some attention around the world and here, and you've been talking about it a great deal. Uh, you obviously thought that something in today's academia needed exposing and you've succeeded in highlighting that there are some real issues there. What, uh, what do you mean by grievance studies? How should we understand grievance studies? Well, uh, grievance studies is the kind of scholarship that begins with the assumption that there will be a power imbalance and then seeks to find it in very specific ways. So we have been accused of being against all scholarship into um, social justice issues or identity issues, which, which isn't the case. What we're looking at is a very specific kind of theory. It's rooted in the postmodern idea that knowledge is a construct of power. It sees society as working within systems of power which put white people above non-white people and men above women. And then it looks for evidence of this and it will read it very interpretively into anything. So we've criticised this quite straightforwardly, but many um, well-meaning um, academics have told us that they think we're overstating the problem. There's just a few mad papers out there. Generally, the premise is good, the motivations are sound. So we, our project essentially gathered together so as many terrible papers as we could find and cited them all absolutely sincerely, um, in order to make really horrendously unethical and unevidenced arguments ourselves, to just try and, and show how easy it is to get this kind of scholarship accepted as knowledge. So something like 20 hoax papers, and a significant number of them were taken by academic journalists and published, often with some quite laudatory remarks uh, about the excellence of your scholarship. Yes, I mean, we, we retired six of them as unworkable, but we had seven accepted and seven more were in the process when we had to call a halt. So um, we were getting better and better at it and we could have carried on indefinitely getting out a couple of papers a month that said increasingly mad things and drawing on itself, but we obviously weren't going to do that because that would be unethical and we don't want that um, uh, understood as knowledge out in out in academia, but it's, it's worryingly easy to just familiarise yourself with these ideas and, and write horrible things. Uh, some of it's just absurd. We were talking a minute ago about that, and, and let's, let's be honest about them, clever thinking people. I don't buy this idea that there are you know, super smart people and lots of dumb people, which I hear a lot of now. We've just had an election in Australia. There are many particularly in the commentariat today, who are plainly now disdainful of ordinary Australians who voted in ways that they disapproved of. So let's dispose of that. But when they hear some of this sort of stuff, they're going to say, what on earth is that talking about? I mean, one of your papers touted insights, uh, and I'm quoting from the, the newspaper here, into male rape culture based on the inspection of 10,000 dog genitals. I mean, really? What, was the, what did it claim to show and who published it? That was um, Gender, Place and Culture. That's a, um, a feminist geography journal. So we're not worried about geography. It's not one of the high up geography journals. But when you get a kind of identity study attached to any other discipline, like feminist geography, feminist social work, then that is when you see some real sort of madness appear. So yeah, our um, dog park paper, as we call it, it, um, it argued that by examine, by looking at dogs in a dog park and um, incidents of unwanted humping among them and how humans reacted to that, we could confidently state that um, both dog parks and nightclubs were rape condoning spaces and that we should train men like dogs. And we submitted a first draft of of this and it was received positively. One of the reviewers suggested it could be benefited by the addition of black feminist criminology. So we, we did that and <laughs> it, it really is an absolutely absurd paper but there's also a very dark element there because the reason it went down well 
was because we were claiming a kind of implicit bias. If you, you've seen um, the reference to implicit biases, we can't see um, racism and sexism so easily anymore because it's been criminalized and it's also frowned upon, but it's still believed to be there. So a lot of scholarship looks into ways to dig it out and make it visible. So by making these claims about how people responded to their dogs, we were feeding into that. And by making uh, men uh, the villains of the piece, we were also flattering the political biases. So it's... Uh, <laughs> and I understand one of your colleagues is now facing a really nasty backlash designed, I would think, to intimidate uh, and to smear rather than to acknowledge that he's exposed something or you have exposed something that needed to be exposed. Mm. Yeah, we, we are most worried about Peter. There's um, constant um, uh, worries for him at, at Portland State University. There's only so much we can talk about it because he's, um, he's not um, allowed to tell people a lot of what's going on with the internal sort of um, reviews and things, but he has, yeah, he's been found guilty of not getting um, ethical clearance uh, to, to test journals, which um, is ridiculous, but that that's, that's, doesn't seem like it's going to be a huge thing. We, he's been um, cleared of data fabrication because we did um, reveal it ourselves and uh, had the papers withdrawn. Data fabrication, what was, what was behind him being accused of falsifying data? Well, um, I hope you won't think less of us, but we didn't actually examine 10,000 dog genitals. I'm terribly <laughs> disappointed. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, I mean, what can you say? <laughs> really? This is what we've tried. We've tried to point out to, yeah. to people that so, even if we so had... So we're not irresponsible and stupid for publishing this rubbish. <laughs> You've done the wrong thing yes. because you didn't examine 10,000 dog genitals. Yeah, dogs and this is... Genitals. This is one of the criticisms that a few of our papers had data and it, it wasn't real. But the, we did need to test whether highly implausible data um, would raise any concerns with them. I mean, how is it possible to have 10,000 different dogs in one town and to examine their genitals while asking the owners about their sexuality? It, it's, it's, it really should have been questioned. And even if we had been able to show that we had done that, it wouldn't justify the claim that that dog parks and nightclubs are rape condoning spaces. So this focus on the data and whether or not it was real is, is really a, a red herring to get away from the fact that we shouldn't have drawn the conclusions from it than we, that we did anyway. Well, <laughs> there are a couple of other doozies that you've referred to here in Australia. One was um, another recycled material uh, from uh, Hitler's Mein Kampf uh, with feminist rebadging. Mm. And a third declared that bodybuilding was fat exclusion, really. Yes. Fat studies is um, one of the smaller and newer um, fields that is, is really quite worrying because it, um, it, it kind of it draws on, on queer theory and it goes back to Foucault and his idea that science um, decides what is true and what is healthy and that it's done to oppress people. So fat studies explicitly rejects the claim that um, obesity is unhealthy and it puts pressure on research organisations and uh, medical authorities not to um, advise people to lose weight. And so we wrote this paper with the help of, um, well, with the permission of a, a former bodybuilder and academic, um, Richard Baldwin, who kindly donated us his name. And um, we argued that the only reason people admire bodybuilders uh, who have built their body with muscle and not um, obese people who have built their body with eating huge amounts of food is because there's uh, prejudice against fat people. And so bodybuilding could benefit from including the non-competitive um, display of fat bodies alongside muscular ones. And there was, in that paper just has an awful lot of uh, silliness in it and I, I take that one quite personally because I've been trying to engage with fat studies as I, I don't precisely have thin privilege myself and it's very difficult to talk about the health problems and for people who are trying um, to lose weight or trying to get healthy this kind of um, activism going on in the background preventing them getting the right advice and the right medical treatment is, is I think, is going to be much more of a problem than is currently recognised. 
it brings to mind, I think uh, George Orwell would have not, have, he wouldn't have described himself as a, a conservative. He wrote 1984, of course, amongst other things. And he, uh, he had a quip uh, once to the effect that uh, some ideas are so stupid that only an academic would believe them. A man in the street would see through them in an instant. This raises very real questions about the objectivity and professionalism, if you like, uh, of um, big slabs of academia. Can we just drill for a moment? Not all of the articles were published and there were plainly many academic journals uh, and, the, and their editors who, who, who did not publish. How do we know who we can trust and who we can't? Who, who's reliable? Who does a high quality job? How, how does the man in the street know when he picks a journal up that this is a journal that will have done a proper due diligence, for want of a better word, and, and won't be publishing rubbish. That this is the problem. The average non-academic person is not qualified to judge what is coming out of um, of identity studies in the way, same way I couldn't evaluate a physics paper. So we do need people with um, expertise in those fields, and we need them to be doing their job properly. So a lot of our work was aimed at uh, people in the humanities who are reasonable, who value evidence, who value ethical consistency, to try to get them not to, out of some kind of loyalty to colleagues or a, a feeling that any kind of work which looks at social justice issues must be good, they turn a blind eye to the really terrible scholarship and we want them to stop doing that. We want them to criticise it and we want them to be able to criticise it without being accused of being uh, white supremacists, misogynists, or, or whatever else. So we that that whole field, that whole process of social justice scholarship and how it is evaluated really needs to be overturned. It needs to be made rigorous so that people can trust it again. Because that the, the worst thing that could happen from this is that people will no longer trust anything that's coming out about social injustice. They are going to be inclined to dismiss um, genuine cases of racism, sexism, homophobia, unless we can make the information that's coming out more reliable. Uh, one thing that, um, that worries me enormously as somebody who was involved in public life for a long time is the breakdown of trust in our institutions. Mm. And the uh, academic work in Australia that you can rely on in this field, I know, is the Australian National University work on trust uh, in our federal parliament. Uh, 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 distrust is at a very, very high level. Trust is at a very, very low level by historical standards. Quite frightening stuff. You could say the same of a number of other institutions. Uh, immense damage is done, done to the standing of many institutions uh, by the uh, Royal Commission of Inquiry into child sexual abuse. We've had one into banks, we've got one into aged care. In this country, our universities are on a knife edge. I don't think they realise it yet but they're in grave danger of losing the confidence, I think, of the people who support them, the Australian taxpayers. We see it on a whole number of fronts. But internationally, where do you think academia stands now in terms of being trusted and being trustworthy? This is something that, um, that worries us particularly. This is why we put out a, a piece of principal defence of the university before we revealed anything, because our greatest fear is that the undermining of, of confidence in certain kinds of identity studies is going to feed into populist and anti-intellectual um, demands to, to dissolve universities. They are going, there yes. is so much danger that, that people will generally lose confidence not only in some bizarre theoretical scholarship, but in scholarship itself. So that, that is something that I think we need to address. People have criticised us saying that our project feeds in to the undermining of confidence in the universities. But I don't think that that argument works because if there is genuinely a problem, we cannot deal with it by pretending it doesn't exist and hoping the critics don't notice either. They've noticed. We need to be seen to try and fix it. Helen, if, if nothing else comes out of the con this conversation, it's that. You know, when there's a problem, it needs to be put out into the open, into the sunlight, so that people know there's a problem. It can't be escaped. You can't get around it anymore. So I think that's a really important observation. If we accept that postmodernism is a prevailing orthodoxy now on most campuses across the Western world, it might be useful to stop and think about what it is. And you actually have said, and I think this is quite brilliant, 
The defining quality of postmodernism is a move away from the aim for objective truth, both morally and factually. Can you elaborate on that so that a layman might have a better understanding of what postmodernism really is? Yeah, I, I can certainly break down this um, conception of society, which I, I think is, um, is important for people to get a grip on. But I think when we say um, postmodernism has control of, of campuses, I think we're looking at an evolved form of it, which has some power over campus culture and some departments. I still um, insist that the majority of scholarship that is coming out of universities is sound. The majority of students and um, faculty are not uh, postmodern thinkers, but that's not to say it isn't a dominant, yeah, a dominant orthodoxy at the moment when it comes to, to social justice and identity issues. But yeah, at root, the postmodernism has what we've called a, a, a knowledge principle and a political principle. So the political principle is that society is formed of structures of power and privilege and marginalization. So society is set up to um, protect the interests of heterosexual, white, Western, rich men. And everybody on the other side of those, as well as disabled and, and fat people, are on the bottom of this hierarchy of power. And this works through discourses. It's the way we talk about things. We constantly keep each other in our places by talking in certain ways about things so that perhaps we'd say things which indicate we think men should take the lead and women should take a, a back seat and uh, that uh, you know your doctor uh, should be white and your gardener should be uh, non-white. And so it's these kind of discourses which they see as permeating society and keeping everybody in their place. So objective knowledge um, in this sense, it comes from this conception of society as constructing knowledge through these power discourses. So Foucault called it power knowledge. So we think what seems so obvious and, um, and true to us is actually just a construct of these systems of power. It'd be useful for us, I think, if we had some understanding of how postmodernism has evolved. Uh, if I could preface my remarks, giving away my own biases a little, G.K. Chesterton once observed that when men stop believing in God, they start believing in anything. Mm -hmm. It does seem to me that we were promised that this new secular age would lead to a greater objectivity, more rational thinking, more reason, less subjective uh, thinking, and yet we seem to be less committed to objectivity than ever. Yeah, I don't think that um, the postmodern um, culture can be considered secular in any meaningful way. It, um, it has an awful lot of the same qualities as religion. And I, we've, um, we've talked a lot about wanting a kind of secularism, which includes um, a social justice ideas in that you can hold them, you can practice them, you can live your life according to them, you can't institutionalize them. So in that sense, I think we are thinking very much of postmodernism as not a religion itself, but as equivalent to one in the sense of fulfilling social and psychological needs. I don't think as many, um, uh, conservative intellectuals have claimed recently that the problem of postmodernism is a direct result of the decline of religion. That doesn't seem to fit geographically. And I don't think, I, I wouldn't have said that either. It's just that there's been, if you like, a marked decline in objectivity and thinking mm. that we, we were told would, you know, not happen mm. if we broke away from the chains of religion. Yeah, what we are seeing of, with postmodernism is a break away from religion, certainly to a certain extent in the sense of Christianity. It can be very positive towards minority um, religions and spiritual practices. But we're also seeing, more importantly, a break away from um, liberalism, from modernity, from that, um, that understanding of society in which Arguments have to be reasoned, evidence has to be provided, ethics have to be consistent. So the postmodernists are called such because they are uh, in opposition to modernity. And by that, they do mean this rise of, of secularism, this rise of liberalism, 
and this um, scientific evidence-based way of looking at things. They see this as a construct of the West, which is really a product of straight white men, that it um, disadvantages unfairly other forms of knowledge which are seen to belong to people of minority racial or um, cultural identification. Um, it disadvantages women, trans people, the disabled, because it's all been constructed in the service of dominant groups in society. So the postmodern, the original postmodernists, what I would call the first wave of them, they appeared in the late 1960s. And they are best understood as a manifestation of complete despair at the breakdown of Marxism. So Marxism had proved itself not to work. There was a great disillusionment amongst leftist academics and postmodernism really can best be defined as can we trust anything anymore? And so they then they, they're talking about meta narratives. That's those large overarching explanations for things which keep us sort of unified and focused. So they criticize Christianity, they criticize Marxism and they criticize science. And then we're left with a big mess, really, because we can't count on anything. Even language is unreliable. So the original postmodernists are characterized by despair. But then in the late 1980s, we saw a second wave, and that's recovered some hope and some um, attempt to rebuild things. So we have people like uh, Mary Poovey in feminism, um, Kimberley Crenshaw in critical race theory, and they appeared all at once and they started saying, well, postmodernism has some good ideas with uh, cultural constructivism and systems of power, but we have to object to accept that some objective truth exists. If we can't say that there is a group of people called women and they um, experience certain disadvantages because they are women, we can't do anything. So what became true in the second wave that we call applied postmodernism is that it was accepted as objectively true that these systems of power and privilege exist and everything else is culturally constructed. So we have to start with the assumption that this imbalance is going to exist within any interaction uh, that happens. And then we have to look at how the prejudice has been constructed in language and in attitudes around it. So that, that was the next wave. And that's what we see most in theories like queer theory and post-colonial theory, uh, critical race theory. And then in the last sort of five to 10 years, we've seen a new wave altogether, which has brought all of these theories, um, queer theory and critical race theory and feminism, um, all into a big mess that I t just tend to call social justice scholarship. And it has, it, it's making a really strong objective truth claim. The language now is really certain. In the first postmodernists, it was difficult to follow what they were saying because it was so obscure, it was so doubtful, they couldn't be sure of anything. Now we have things like all white people are racist, black people cannot be racist. And these terms of absolute certainty, which is the third stage. And I'm in a way, it's a hopeful thing because we can understand them now. We know what they're saying and we can argue with it. Yeah, the return of absolutism <clears throat> is a very interesting development. Yeah. Because in, in a moral relativity doesn't allow for it. It says that oh, there's no such thing as truth. There aren't no absolutes. Yep. Except for the absolute, that there are no absolutes. Exactly. But you're saying we've moved <laughs> beyond that. And we're now seeing the emergence of some absolutes. Anybody who dares to argue with social justice warriors will very quickly discover, I think, today, yeah. that they do actually believe in absolutes. Yes. So to backtrack from that, if postmodernism doesn't think truth, though, is really attainable, even if they're moving a bit on that, uh, that evidence has to be discounted in favour of looking for the social drivers, if you like, and constructs of the world that we live in. How can that be anything other than corrosive for the idea of a university dedicated to the pursuit of understanding and truth? Uh, well, you're not going to get an argument from me that it can be considered any other way. I, I think that there's, uh, there's, there's some good stuff coming out of this. But the premises are so very bad. So often when I'm reading um, some uh, papers and, and books around um, these kind of theories, I see some really sharp thinkers who are thinking rigorously, but they're starting from very bad premises. So I am actually quite a fan of, of Jose Medina and Christy Dotson, who are epistemologists. And they do some really solid work, but they've started 
from the premise that knowledge is tied to identity. There is a way that men think, there's a way that women think, black people, white people, and they're, they're building from that. And so their, their theories cannot work because this, this simply isn't the case that all men think the same or all women do. This, this doesn't work. But I am hopeful if we could change the tide, there are some good scholars in there who could apply their ideas productively. So that I think is the, the silver lining in there. There are still smart people, they are still ethically motivated, but I think they've gone wrong. But on, on top of that, there's an awful lot of scholars who are really just taking advantage of the ability to write total theoretical fluff without substance, and I have no sympathy for them. <laughs> It, it raises a question for me, given the experience you had with your hoax papers, as to whether a postmodernist is actually capable of establishing clearly whether something's evidence-based or not. Mm. Can they do it? I, well, they, for what they would do with this is they, they, would, they can understand um, what they call the correspondence model of reality, whether what we're saying actually corresponds with reality, <laughs> obviously. But they they're not sympathetic to this. They would call this the uh, Western philosophical tradition and say that it is dominated unfairly. So an example that um, is given in, I think it's Barbara Applebaum's book, when she's looking at different kinds of knowledge, she says that there was a survivor of Auschwitz who reported um, seeing all four of the chimneys burn. And when her testimony was taken in court, photos were shown that only one of the chimneys had burned. So her testimony was discounted because she hadn't remembered accurately with the, the correspondence model of truth. And what the theorist pointed out was that that woman's memory may not have been factually accurate, but what she was recounting was an experience. So maybe her experience of what had happened had produced a memory which wasn't factually accurate, but did speak to experience, and we are interested in experience at least as much as we are interested in facts. And I think to, in, to some degree, that is true. If we were to talk to this, this poor woman, we would want to know how she coped, how she felt, is she recovering? And we wouldn't be interested in chimneys particularly. But when we're talking about scholarship, we cannot have truth claims which have social power that are used for social engineering, which are based on the experiences of certain groups of people who believe in these theories. Because it isn't the case, as they would imply, that we listen to, um, say, all, all black people, and then we um, obtain knowledge from their experiences and go ahead with it, because you're going to have middle class black people, upper class black people, working class black people, conservatives, liberals, con <laughs> that there's just isn't a black knowledge. And so when this kind of theorist says that they are, are listening to black people and they're using um, this kind of knowledge, they are really only talking about the ones who already agree with them. If we could move to the practicalities then, what does this confusion, because I don't think you can put it any other way, in academia, mean for our societies? I, I, the, the thing with universities is that knowledge isn't meant to remain there. The whole purpose of them is that they produce it and they disseminate it throughout the population. And that, that is what's happening. People who have been to university, who have studied these identity theories, go on to become teachers of our children, heads of our industries. And these ideas get perpetuated, they get simplified and um, and they, they, they trickle down. And so we get activists who have a very sort of simplistic um, idea of these power structures that they're arguing for, but may never have read Foucault, for, for example. So I think we need to tackle the ideas where they are, at the root, in the universities. We need to make them, we need to show the problem with them. We need to make them fall out of favor. We need to make it a bit embarrassing to not even try to have evidence or make sense. And that's, that's how we used to feel about these kind of arguments. And, and I think we need to reinstitute that. And when it's coming to young people who are starting university now, I frequently get letters um, from them and saying that they want to set up some of their own groups. They want to push back at some of this um, moral orthodoxy. And I'm, I'm hoping to start um, 
to start visiting some more student groups, giving them some support and getting them going because I, I don't think Generation Z is going to put up with this. I think we're going to see a pushback from the younger people. This idea, this postmodern idea is really quite, quite old now. It still tries to pretend that it is new and radical, but its original theorists have mostly died. And it, I think it's seen its day. So if we can support the youngest people, those starting university now, uh, to challenge it, that's what my book is hopefully going to do. It's going to break it down for people and get them to push back. I, th I think that's what we need to do. I, I, anecdotally, I know, you should, here I am saying you've got to look at the objectivity and evidence, <laughs> but I met an extremely bright young man only a couple of weeks ago at one of our best universities. Uh, and he just observed to me, he's studying in the humanities, although he's also doing economics. He said, that, he said to me, I honestly believe that 80% of the students I interact with believe that they're being fed a lot of ideology. They see through it. They don't believe it, but they will play to it to get through because they know they have to. That's pretty chilling. I, I'm not surprised by this. I mean, of course, I'd, I'd be, I can't know numbers, but I, I would be very surprised if more than a minority of students were genuinely radical cultural constructivists with this ideological understanding of power and language. I don't think they are, but it is a worry that they're, they're having to speak through this system. And it, it's, you know, in that sense, Foucault was, um, was not far from being right. We power, language does have power. We are at risk of accepting this conception of the world if we don't keep pushing back at it. Now, one of the points that you've made while you've been here is that, uh, of course, the people who go through our university systems then become uh, not only leaders of industry, but also our teachers. So uh, this filters through very quickly into what happens in the formation of the minds of our young people, our students in classrooms. I think that's of deep concern to Australian parents. I, I think it is. I, I don't want people to despair of this. I think um, some of us, most of us now, are a bit spoilt through ha from having lived through many decades without um, extreme ideologies. You know, but it was only it, it was only sort of seventy years ago that there we saw the rise of, um, of fascist and communist ideologies which have been which have been overcome they were in universities people were arguing this and we did overcome it i think we can overcome postmodernism i don't want um, to encourage people to catastrophize or think it's the end of the world we need to end universities or or ban any kind of speech that's not what we need to do we need to win this battle of ideas and i think there is enough of us to do it the the story that you just told about the young man what we need to try and do is get that 80% who don't agree with this to see the importance of together saying that they don't and having the good arguments against it and articulating them well and pushing back at it. And, and that's why I think hearing from people like you with what you've said today is so very valuable. It, it starts to equip people who are interested, who by definition will be, I suppose, the leaders, the innovators, the people who will want to pick it up and start the, start the, the, the haul back. And I think that we've we've forgotten how to defend um, the values of modernity because we have taken it for granted for so long. The, the the general culture has been liberal. We have just assumed everybody should have a fair shot at everything, regardless of the gender, race, and sexuality. We have these ideas of fairness and the importance of evidence, and they've been dominant for so long that we've forgotten how to argue for them. So I think we need to learn that again. I think this needs to be taught in schools. I mean, this is one of the, the dangers with Peter's job being constantly under threat. He is one of the few professors left who teaches critical thinking along these lines. And if they may succeed in getting him out, I'm not sure they'll replace that. So we need to get more of this going on in universities and at a lower level as well. Well, amen to that. <laughs> Helen, one of the observations that you've made that I think is legitimate and important, and I agree with that perhaps that's why I think it's legitimate and important, but you've said that no one pretends that in our age, in the modern age, we've got everything right. But what's important about it is that we've been able to see we haven't got everything right and we've been able to move to fix things. And amen to that. I think that's right. The um, scenes we've seen on our television sets with two million people in Hong Kong 
you know, massive proportion of the population out there making it very plain that they are prepared to be very courageous to defend their freedoms though, should remind us that in the Western tradition, we've gone a long way down the road of establishing the freest societies really the world has ever seen. Easy to knock that idea, but it's true when you stop and think about it. Yes, absolutely. I mean, I, I think we do take our freedoms for granted and we, we take democracy for granted. I'm Obviously, when, when I see um, uh, Iranian feminists, you know, pulling off their hijabs and um, demanding the right not to have to wear them, and I, I think, well, feminism, feminism is important there, and I am I am grateful to the feminists who went before me and got got me access to all the things I have now. So I do think we need to not take this for granted. I do think we need to push back at that very cynical, pessimistic idea that we're that we're not still advancing, that, that this is some kind of patriarchal colonial system and be glad for what we've got and also keep improving it. Mm. And again, I find myself in furious agreement. <laughs> it seems to me that one of the keys to this is that we simply have to operate on the basis of respect and civility in a democratic tradition and that that's being challenged. And when I say civility, it sounds like, uh, you know, we just ought to be nice to one another in the way that we talk. Uh, and you should hold your knife and fork properly and uh, uh, I'll say please and thank you. It's much, much more than that. True civility, I think, is a very robust virtue. It means that we can deal with our deepest disagreements by arguing the issues, not denigrating one another. And there's a terrible pattern now uh, where our starting point is if we disagree, your idea is immoral, therefore you're immoral, Therefore, I won't hear you. I think, yes, I, I made a similar argument to this, but um, used the word charity much more. I, I think that we need to talk to people that we disagree with strongly, and we need to say so. We don't have to hedge around those disagreements. We can express them very strongly. But start from the principle of charity. Uh, believe that the person you are speaking to is both sincere and well-intentioned, and then go from there. President Eisenhower commented once that you should never judge a person's motives. Uh, their wisdom, yes, but not their motives. I think that given the range of views in our society now and the enormous challenges, frankly, confronting the West, economic, environmental, strategic, they're very serious. Uh, as we, at the same time as we face this grave self-doubt, even self-loathing in our culture, we have to re-establish re the ability to be able to argue as vigorously as we like, but to not personalise it, to not give way to the desire to demonise the other person or, or allow ourselves to be demonised. Mm -hmm. And if I have a worry about the modern debate as I hear it, including out of our universities, it is that we go to demonise first. Uh, and then talk later, and by which time it's often too late. I, I, I agree with that, yes, certainly. <laughs> Helen, it's been terrific. Thank you so much for giving us your time. Thank you for having me. It's been you lovely. can't get good public policy out of a bad debate. That's our <laughs> strap line on this show. Right, sir, yep, I'm with that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>